Good morning. Uh, my name is Rajan Naidu, and um, welcome to Invitrix third annual scientific conference. What a difference a year makes, and uh, I recognize many of you from previous conferences, and um, welcome to all the new people. I'm sure that uh, you have had a productive and wonderful year. Uh, Invitrix is uh, very proud, and I am very proud to once again be part of a movement towards change. I was listening to all your comments this morning and everyone who has contributed to this industry is all very excited that we are making changes. We are de definitively changed the vernacular and the semantics of cellular therapy and the science thereof. So we're so excited that our speakers uh, and Dr. Kaplan in, uh, accepted our invitation to uh, attend today, and uh, uh, we are very excited that we can present to you what is the uh, what is in and what is not, and what is appropriate uh, in this day and age. So uh, I look forward to a, the productive conversations at the end of this session. Uh, to begin with, uh, would really love to give you uh, an overview of uh, the company and I'd like to invite uh, the Chief Executive Officer Habib Tofi uh, to the stage please. Good morning everyone. Uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, uh, your presence here. I know some of you have traveled long and far to be here. As an avid traveler, uh, I sympathize with your jet lag. Uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Naidu uh, alluded to, I think uh, the, the space that we are in is uh, exploding, uh, not only here in US, but uh, globally. The, Early on, Invitrex decided to focus on building a CGMP facility. This is prior to the memorandum from FDA, uh, the three-year memorandum that uh, ex-FDA uh, commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, put in place. We decided, rather than anything else, really commit to the safety of the product by building a uh, CGMP facility, uh, bringing in a, a robust regulatory affair team, and our commitment, again, coming from academia, our commitment was to also build a, a robust research and development segment in the company. There are two areas in the company that is currently are expanding and growing. One, our commitment to quality. Uh, Dr. Superna is uh, heading that effort. Uh, those of you who have uh, been around in Vitrix know Dr. Ken Berger. To me, he is uh, perhaps the leading uh, cell therapy uh, expert in the area. And we are so glad that, as I said, putting a nucleus of quality system uh, regulatory affair in place as uh, we go through these challenges uh, with uh, this aspect of our business. But more importantly, I think uh, in uh, the slides here, I uh, like to basically talk to about two areas that we are focusing on in R&D. One is the uh, exosomal aspect of uh, uh, therapy, two is tar targeted immunocell therapy or immuno-oncology uh, or CAR-T. So we have brought in uh, a group of uh, folks to help really build that aspect of our business because that is where uh, cell therapy is going and Invitrix is committed to uh, that aspect uh, and growing the company not only here in US, but internationally. If we can uh, roll the slides, uh, please. There we go. 
So this is, uh, this is our facility, and uh, we have occupied the place for uh, about two years. It took us two years to build it. Uh, you know, we had a challenge of uh, dealing with uh, the construction folks, but here we are. Uh, this is uh, our uh, GMP facility. Of course, the GMP facility without the quality system uh, does not really meet uh, the FDA requirements, and our commitment is to slowly and gradually build the quality system that could fit uh, the facility. Uh, again, as I uh, mentioned, uh, the, the exosomal aspect of our business is uh, fast growing with uh, having uh, a team of uh, R&D in place uh, to uh, become one of the front runners uh, in, in this business. Uh, the second one is CAR-T. As you know, the, the CAR-T aspect of uh, uh, science of it is moving rapidly. Uh, there are uh, areas that uh, We'll cover later on as far as uh, fast CAR-T, universal CAR-T, and other technologies that are coming in. This is uh, perhaps uh, the third or fourth generation of uh, targeted immunocell therapy or immune oncology. Uh, our uh, dear friend, Dr. Crasco, Antonio Crasco from uh, Peru, will be able to share uh, the advances uh, of both the science and clinical aspect of CAR-T to share that with you. Uh, this is uh, uh, some of the projects that we currently have uh, in, uh, and this is a map depicting the nations that we are in. Believe it or not, uh, to date in 2018, I have been to every one of these spots and more to come. Uh, I, I'm an avid traveler. I enjoy traveling. I uh, have to remind myself to do business because when I travel, I go see my friends and uh, last minute, I tell him, listen, we need to talk about business because if I go home, Sean is going to ask me, what did you do when you were in Dublin? <laughs> Besides running and drinking uh, Guinness. <laughs> so my, uh, the, uh, this morning, I woke up with uh, a news that uh, for the first time ever in human history, uh, uh, we broke... Uh, a two-hour uh, marathon. Folks, this is an amazing achievement uh, as an avid runner, as a distance runner. Uh, this is a day that we were all waiting for. This is, if you, some of you old enough remember when we were trying to make, uh, break the former uh, mile. Uh, Dr. Ken Berger remembers. He was born in 1888, so he waited a long time. Uh, with that note, I'm going to uh, uh, start the uh, aspect, uh, the scientific aspect of business. With that, is my uh, honor to introduce to you uh, Dr. Milad uh, Razaifar. Uh, Dr. Milad comes to us uh, from UCI. Uh, this is where, uh, at the time I was uh, uh, interacting with UCI, I saw him as a rising star. Uh, he went to City of Hope uh, for two years, helped uh, develop the program, uh, not only from the scientific aspect of it, but he was also uh, involved in the regulatory pathway. Uh, he is really someone uh, that we are going to really lean on to direct our uh, R&D effort. Uh, with that further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Milad to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Abby, for a great, uh, you know, uh, introduction. It's about you forgot something uh, very important about me. So I have a special talent uh, that no one discovered. So I'm very good and expert on spilling coffee on myself and this white shirt uh, before uh, talks. So today I was very uh, like cautious not to do that. Luckily that didn't happen. So if you want to uh, learn how to spill uh, coffee on any surfaces uh, professionally, please uh, come to talk to me after the presentation. 
So uh, uh, today we will be talking about the uh, cell free uh, uh, therapeutics uh, in the context of uh, autoimmune disease. Um, so I started my uh, journey at uh, UC Irvine where uh, we decided to uh, uh, look into the mechanism that how mesenchymal stem cell or mesenchymal stromal cells uh, uh, do their function. So I started sending emails uh, to uh, you know a lot of uh, leaders in the field, and uh, we uh, bumped into uh, vesicles. Back then, they used to call it microparticles. Then we were thinking maybe uh, cells, when they go to the body, they produce these microparticles. So I started sending email to many people, then eventually ended up in the uh, lab of Dr. Jan Lotwal. He's the guy who uh, discovered that these cells produce these vesicles. And uh, this is uh, where he, he discovered that this is another way of cell-to-cell -cell communication. So with that in mind, uh, let's get to this autoimmune disease. Uh, I didn't know that uh, the audience is so expert on all these you know, uh, diseases and uh, mesenchymal stem cell and all those sort of stem uh, cells. So uh, basically, uh, we go through some of these slides very fast. Uh, so autoimmune disease, as you know, it's a you know, host of condition that immune system attack itself. And we have over, over 100 different types of uh, autoimmune disease. So current therapeutics, as you know, are not working very well. Or if they do, they do uh, come with serious side effects, such as uh, cancer and infection. So the question is, what would be uh, the ideal therapy to talk to these angry cells, angry immune system cells that attacking the host tissue and cells? How can we talk to them? Basically, uh, we were thinking that uh, effective treatment might be uh, find a language to see uh, what kind of you know, uh, way they use to talk and uh, what is their language. And uh, in 2007, Jan Lotfall, as I uh, told you guys, discovered that cells use uh, vesicles to you know, uh, make this uh, communication. And when they want to engage, uh, this is another part of you know when the cells want to have uh, engagement with each other. So we were thinking, okay, that's good if they they use these uh, uh, blips, vesicles to talk. So why not we use it to talk to these immune system cells and angry cells, tell them to calm down in the context of uh, uh, autoimmune disease. So this is the paper uh, Jan Lotfall published in uh, 2007. He discovered that cells, all the cells that we know today, release these vesicles. These are basically blips that uh, you know, carry some information from one cell to the uh, recipient cell. And uh, this is me and Jan Lotwal. Uh, he loves Newport Beach. He's from Sweden. So whenever he comes in, you know, I have to take him to a coast, you know, give him some ride. And uh, as you can see, I was so young, uh, uh, sorry, here. So if you want to get into the uh, exosome business, you see how old I am? Be careful. So uh, this field makes you uh, degenerate very fast. So think about it one more time if you want to get into exosome business. So uh, then the question is, how come it took so long that people discover these vesicles sending some information? That could be uh, like an easy discovery. That is correct. We have known these vesicles for over 30 years. And uh, the problem was that initially, we thought that these uh, vesicles, uh, uh, they are mere garbage. So people believe that whenever cells wanted to uh, you know, uh, put something in their trash can and they wanted to release something that they don't want, they put it into these vesicles. So that's why it took them, uh, it took people, you know, a long time to really discover that this is not, uh, you know, uh, trash. This is another way of cell-to-cell -cell communication. So let's uh, look into the details of what are these vesicles. Uh, this is this picture coming from a review that we published in annual reviews in 2017. So basically, these extracellular vesicles. Uh, so let me touch on, on the terminology as well. Uh, so the uh, 
uh, right now we, uh, we call it extracellular vesicles. It's like a broad term for all these different types of vesicle. And one of these uh, per, you know, type of vesicles are exosomes. So they can use an interchangeably. So uh, if I use EV or exosome, I mean the same population. So as you can see here, you know, these exosomes coming from endosomal pathway, this is their pathway that they are generated by any cells and they are released uh, uh, from the cells. And the beauty with these vesicles is that they are natural complex packages. So they do have different, different types of lipids, they do have different types of RNA and different types of uh, protein. Why is it important? Because if you wanna use it as a therapy, especially for those uh, complex disease that multiple biological pathways are involved, you cannot just use a small molecule to target one pathway like what Big Pharma does. It doesn't work. And we have seen that it, it, it won't work because complex diseases do need complex uh, therapies. So that why, that's why EVs um, uh, received a lot of attention because of their complexities. Uh, then the question is, okay, these cells release these vesicles. What's gonna happen after that? So these vesicles, either they are in the media or uh, in, the, uh, in the blood, they go and find their target cells. And there are multiple mechanisms proposed that where these uh, so EVs uptaken by the recipient cells, and this is how they deliver their message. I don't want to go through the de detail, but you know, uh, it's a quick. They can bind directly to the receptors. They can get engulfed uh, by the uh, phagocytosis mechanisms, or they can fuse directly and deliver their RNA and protein. So this is the uh, mechanism known as of today for how these. Uh, vesicles uh, uh, transfer their information. Uh, so at UC Irvine, we were thinking, you know, uh, how can we uh, start the exosome project? And we have been, uh, our lab has been always working on uh, mesenchymal uh, cells or mesenchymal stromal cells. I was a young PhD student, very uh, energetic, enthusiastic. Went to MSC 2013 where Dr. Kaplan uh, lead uh, the conference. I went there, you know, hoping uh, that I can talk to him. He was surrounded by all these big people. I couldn't even talk to him. So today I'm gonna talk to him, that's a, a good chance. So I was just watching uh, him, you know, uh, wanna talk to him, I never got a chance. So the other uh, problem was that uh, I was thinking at least I know what does uh, mesenchymal stem cell stand for. I was thinking it's mesenchymal stromal cells, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, but in that conference, I really realized that I was wrong. So, in that conference, I learned that mesenchymal stem cell stands for mesenchymal sexy Kaplan. <laughs> Seriously, uh, so uh, this is what people say. So I was shocked. You know, I was thinking I'm in the field for uh, like a few years. Still, I don't know what it does stand for. It was crazy. So when I get back to UC Irvine, they asked me to give a report. I said, you know, guys, you don't know even what it does stand for. They said, what do you mean? I said, it's just uh, sexy cells. So we have to take it more serious. So since then, I took these cells and anything related to these cells much more serious. So uh, talking about these cells, you know, as you know, Dr. Kaplan is gonna go through the uh, discovery of these cells. I don't wanna, uh, uh, you know, uh, touch on those parts, but uh, initially these cells got the attention that people thought they're gonna differentiate into some lineage, but uh, it took them uh, like a, not a while to realize that one of the key uh, characteristic of these cells that received a lot of attention is their anti-inflammatory properties. That, that's why you know, uh, many uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, diseases have been treated, uh, uh, autoimmune diseases have been treated with this uh, anti-inflammatory capacity of these uh, cells. So we knew that MSC is safe, so we chose it as a cell, as a model, to test our uh, hypothesis. Then we were thinking what kind of model can we, what kind of autoimmune disease can we choose to, to uh, test our hypothesis. So we were uh, thinking, you know, multiple sclerosis, what would be a good uh, model because it's, um, 
unmet, well, it's a, it's, or you can argue that it's not an unmet medical need, but I think it is because the therapies that um, you know, are used for MS, one of them is Gilenia, is uh, 30, it's, it works well, but it comes with serious side effects such as cancer and liver toxicity. And uh, each uh, supply, uh, which is 30, uh, 30 pills per, day, uh, per month, it costs like $12,000. So it's, it's insane. How I can imagine, you know, uh, uh, the, these, uh, and many patients that I talk to, they can't even afford the medication. You have to go through some medical, then if you, uh, you know, earn $1 more, you are not eligible. So uh, uh, it's crazy. So many people uh, drop their uh, medication because they cannot afford. So uh, what one thing I would like to mention in this slide is that in, uh, in multiple sclerosis, as we know, uh, the immune system start attacking nerves, especially in the brain and for some patient in the spinal cord. So what happens is that for some reason that we still don't know, uh, these uh, uh, T cells in the in the blood get activated against the uh, you know antigens uh, on the surface of neurons and bypass blood-brain barrier, go to the uh, brain and start attacking and they recruit more cells. Then uh, that all the damage start. Two key cells are very important in uh, multiple sclerosis pathology. One of them is T cell, the other one is macrophage. These are the bad guys. So remember these two cells, I'm gonna talk about it later on. So T cells and a macrophage are the bad guys. And there's another good guy, which is regulatory T, T cells, or a T rec, are the good guys. So the T rec suppress the inflammation, the other types of uh, T cells and macrophage, um, you know, assault these, uh, uh, these neurons and uh, de uh, you know, uh, degrade them and make them go through you know, uh, apoptosis. So having a safe cell, mesenchymal stem cell or mesenchymal stromal cells in hand and uh, model multiple sclerosis, we hypothesize that, oh, sorry, we hypothesize that if a stem cell drive vesicles can alleviate the uh, multiple sclerosis symptoms, also we hypothesize that uh, maybe these vesicles could be served as a cell-free uh, therapeutics for uh, MS or any autoimmune disease. So having that in mind, we have started uh, doing the experiments. We have started with crazy number of flasks back then where we used to do uh, ultra centrifugation. So what we did, uh, having uh, many flasks, uh, oh, I can use the laser. I don't even know how to use it, forget it. So, uh, uh, so we started with this uh, flask, a lot of flask, you know, uh, then we collected condition media, going through ultra centrifugation, which back then was the gold standard. Still, if you want to do research, it's still considered to be the uh, gold standard uh, isolation uh, method. And uh, then it, we go through uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis to make sure we isolate these vesicles successfully and they do their job. To make sure uh, we do the uh, isolation right and we characterize, we use different methodology to confirm the presence of exosomes in our preparation. We use Western blotting. Seeing is uh, we, uh, we use uh, we use the Western blotting, uh, uh, flow cytometry, electron microscopy uh, to really see these vesicles, uh, and also uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis for their uh, measurement of their size. And one thing that we did uh, in this project, <coughs> we knew that from literature that when you stimulate these cells with uh, with interferon, with any uh, like uh, inflammatory cytokine, it helps them to be more potent and more anti-inflammatory. So we spike them with interferon gamma as a stimulus to make them more more uh, potent. But we didn't know uh, that this is gonna be ended up more potent in our hands. But we just got it from literature. We just want to test to see if stimulating these cells with gamma interferon makes it more potent or not. So this is the uh, piece of data after these isolation of these vesicles. We, if we, if we went through a lot of washes to make sure we, um, you know, we remove this uh, interferon gamma uh, contamination. 
and we did the ELISA to make sure that we don't have any contamination. So this is the most frequently question that I asked, uh, that I've been asked you know, uh, about these projects. So they say you have contamination of the gamma interferon, but we didn't have significant amount. So talking about the uh, characterization of these vesicles, uh, one of the ways you know, uh, uh, was Western blotting, which is basically confirming the presence of pr certain proteins uh, in the in the preparation, these are some of these markers uh, that you know CD eighty one TSU one hundred one uh, that you know well accepted for the uh, uh, being as a marker of these uh, extracellular vesicles, and we both confirm for naive, I mean naive without or native without interferon gamma, or with gamma interferon. So both had the same uh, you know uh, the presence of those markers. Then we went on the, the flow cytometry to confirm the presence of these vesicles. Doing flow is a little bit tricky because these are very small nano size, 30 nanometer to 120 or 200 nanometer. So it's, you cannot do it with conventional flow cytometry uh, methodology. So what you have to do is to capture them on some beads. We have some beads, uh, micron, micron size beads. We capture them on, those be on these beads and we sandwich them. Then we can detect it by the flow cytometer. So basically, we confirm that we do have those vesicles uh, in hand. And as you know, seeing is believing. We went on the, uh, to do uh, uh, electron microscopy on these vesicles. So uh, as you can see, these are the electron microscopy uh, uh, images. And uh, we also confirm the presence of these uh, markers that I showed with Western blotting on these uh, vesicles. These black dots are the confirmation that they have CD63. It's one of the uh, well-known marker for, the, uh, uh, for these uh, exosomes. So we confirmed that. And we did uh, nanoparticle uh, tracking analysis. Basically, it's a small machine. It shines laser on the, these vesicles. And based off these Brownian, Brownian motion and uh, uh, Einstein stock uh, algorithm, it uh, determined the size of these uh, vesicles for you. So uh, and we did that as well to, to really see what are the size. So as you can see here, the size distribution is around, I think, you know, 30, 40 nanometer all the way down to uh, uh, 300 something. So. Then we asked the question, so, so far we knew that we successfully isolated vesicles and we completely characterized it. Then we asked the question, does it have any function? So uh, the function really starts with what kind of disease you want to go after. That determines your function. So we wanted to go after multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease. So ideally we wanted these vesicles to be immune suppressive. So what they did, we just did a CFS CSA, which is a very standard uh, 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 way of showing the suppression of the immune system. So what we did, we did uh, we isolated PBMC, which is the uh, um, uh, uh, pool of blood cells, uh, blood cells, you know, uh, preferred blood uh, mononuclear cells, and we co-culture it with uh, exosomes, and we stimulated with some antibodies for four days, then we. Uh, run the assay. So if they have a lot of green uh, dye, they keep it. It means that they don't proliferate, meaning that the uh, exosome was involved in s some sort of suppression of these cells because they get stimulated with these factors. So the more green, as you can see here, you see, is better, meaning that you have less proliferation. The more to the left side of me, which is here, it more uh, you know proliferation. As you can see, this is the uh, negative control. This is the positive control. This is the interferon gamma, the blue that you can see. Majority is in, in the unstimulated status, and native exosome also was good. So this is that was the first proof that gamma interferon stimulated exosome performed better. That was the first assay we confirmed. So after this, uh, remember I told you guys about TREC as a good guy. So T-Rex are very important in the uh, all autoimmune disease pathology. So t 
T-Rex are, uh, it's believed that they are uh, going through some uh, malfunction in all autoimmune disease. That's why uh, people get autoimmune disease. So this is one of the hypotheses. So then we ask the question, do our, the, do these vesicles uh, induce regulatory T cell? If they do, it's, it's good because they increase the number of these uh, good guys that can suppress the immune system. So we did uh, a lot of assays, so uh, I don't want to go through the detail, but basically, if this is the control without any uh, EVs or exosome, this is uh, 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 MSC interferon gamma. Uh, I cannot see the percentage, so as you can see, yeah, f from 4% to 19.4%, so it's a significant increase in the number of these cells. These are very potent cells. Even if you increase their frequency by three, five percent, that biologically meaning that they have a, a, like a big function. So from four to 19, we were very happy and we didn't expect that. And we did it some other cell population as well. We also did it with the uh, native or naive uh, condition without, but with, uh, without a stimulation, it was like uh, from four to 16, but that one was 19. So a slight increase in the number of T-Rex when you have it with in the interferon gamma stimulated condition. So far, so good. We show that it induces uh, regulated T cells. We show that it suppress PBMC activation but this is all in vitro. So many people don't like to see uh, or are not uh, convinced that these have functions. So we went further, we asked the question, if we have this multiple sclerosis animal model, if we inject it to the animal model, what's gonna happen? So to do that, we first had to uh, use this uh, mouse and um, generate the model. So the gold standard that FDA use for any therapeutics for multiple sclerosis, it's an animal model called uh, EAE, Experimental Autoimmune uh, Encephalomyelitis. So what we do, we just uh, inject some toxin to the animal and in time they get paralyzed. Once they get paralyzed, then you can do your uh, uh, tr treatment. So in our hands, they were mostly paralyzed and uh, the severity of their paralysis was at its most at day 18. So we were thinking, okay, we're gonna use day 18 as the day where we inject these vesicles. And after day 18 till day 40, we uh, do the scoring by hand and give them some scores. The score is gonna be from zero to four. Zero mean that uh, it's healthy, healthy. They can walk, uh, they can um, eat, drink, and four is dead. So basically, this is what we did. We had these uh, exosomes from uh, our cells, isolated, injected to the uh, uh, mouse model. Then we see uh, uh, to see w what's going to happen. So. This is the video of these, uh, one of the videos that I have is uh, from, this is showing the uh, PBS, which is basically the control uh, animal, which is completely paralyzed. And this is the, uh, after one injection of, uh, you know, interferon gamma exosome. As you can see, the control mouse is, oh, cannot even uh, drink and uh, eat but the exosome treated one can walk successfully, and this is the um, uh, average score. I had some of them, we, they were literally running in the cage. It still is not perfect, but compared, it's still wobbling, compared to the uh, control is a dramatic difference. So the fact that they can now walk and eat and drink on their own was so uh, significant, and uh, even if it's not a perfect walking, uh, to us was very uh, you know, significant. Then, this is the quantification of the data. So one thing we were really interested to, to, to test was that, what about the cells? Because we do see a lot of exosome people, they are so religious about these vesicles and they think only these vesicles work, nothing else, cells is a trash, 
uh, only you have to go after uh, these vesicles. We didn't want to be like those uh, guys. So we said, okay, let's test these cells as well. So we tested side-by-side -side comparison, double-blinded experiment, see what's going to happen when you do uh, compare the efficacy of the data we are comparing cells with its correspondent vesicles. So the black line is the control. So th remember, the higher, the worse, the lower, the better. So the, uh, the uh, 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 yellow and the blue are uh, native exosome and uh, native MSC, as you can see, they have similar efficacy. The same goes for interferon gamma. The uh, red and uh, green, they have the same efficacy. So uh, the conclusion here is that you can use exosomes or the cells, both works. But which one is better depends on what kind of condition, what kind of disease, what kind of route of injection you want to go after. It's not like 100% cells is better all the time or exosome. That really depends on what kind of application uh, you want to go after. But the good news is that both works. So the good news is that now we have a uh, surrogate, now we have a substitute for the cells to show the same efficacy, which is exosome. So after seeing all those uh, uh, animal recovery, we were so happy, then we asked the next question. The next question was that to really look into these animals, to see what is really going on in these animals, and the first thing that we looked at was the myelination. Because myelin is involved with disease recovery, and uh, we were thinking, you know, what would be the, uh, you know, uh, myelination? This is the uh, PBS control. This is native uh, exosome. This is interferon gamma. As you can see, you know, uh, demyelination is a lot more, you know, the more the blue, the better. We uh, use a special dye, which is specifically the you know stain the myelin. So the more the blue you see in these areas, are the better. So as you can, and the red areas are the degenerated, uh, degenerated you know or degrade, degraded uh, myelin. So PBS have more, less on native and less less on interferon gamma exosome. So that was good. Then we asked, okay, previously. If you remember, we showed that we suppress PBMC. Then we asked, okay, well, let's look into some of those uh, immune system as well. And if you recall, I just mentioned that one of the bad guys are macrophage and T cells. These are the bad guys which attack these myelin. So we decided to look into the spinal cord, looking to see what are the percentage infiltration of these cells into the uh, uh, spinal cord. So we look at uh, macrophage and T cell infiltration. These red dots are the activated or infiltrated macrophage or macroglia. So the more they swallow, the more they are present, meaning that they secrete more factor to, uh, to chew and degrade the myelin. So the less, the better. So this is the PBS control. You see we have tons of these cells. And this is the native exosome and interferon gamma exosome. They have uh, significantly less infiltrated bat cells or macrophages into the spinal cord. We also look at CD4 and CD8 cells as those bad guys. So uh, we do see significant reduction, as you can see here, for CD4, CD8. We do see significant reduction in the infiltration of these bad guys into the immune, uh, into the uh, spinal cord. So for some reason, exosome treatment uh, stopped the infiltration of these cells into the spinal cord. And this is why we think it helped with the recovery of those animals. Then the next question was that, how about TREG? So TREG are the good guys. As I mentioned, the more you have them, the better. In the previous slide, we showed that we increase the frequency of these cells in vitro. But we asked the question, how about in vivo, in the animal? Working with these cells are very difficult. And uh, the frequency of these cells in vivo, even in animal or uh, human, are very uh, low. So working with them and detecting them was very difficult. So this 
set of a slide that you can see, it took me almost a year to, to finish and come up with the ways to really detect these cells. So, uh, uh, so basically, we, for the first time, uh, no one has ever done uh, these uh, detections. People use flow cytometry to show these cells uh, you know, increased, but we really wanted to see them in the spinal cord. So for the first time, we show that these exosomes induce the uh, f increase the frequency of T cells, uh, regulatory T cells in the spinal cord. So these green uh, dots are the staining for those cells. So the more, and these are the the areas that the you know re the degeneration was happening, and they come in to help. To suppress. So, as you can see here, this is the, for the PBS. We hardly see anything native condition exosome and interferon gamma, and this is the quantification. Also, we did we did see efficacy with that animal model we saw, but in order to see uh, and stain these uh, cells, we did we needed to use a special mouse, which is a FOXP3 uh, GFP positive uh, mouse. And that mouse, when you inject the toxin, they get sick much uh, in a more severe level. Then we asked the question, do we see efficacy in this sensitive animal as well? So we repeated all those experiments. We got, surprisingly, we didn't expect that. Surprisingly, we got the same data. So showing that gamma interferon gives the best uh, recovery rate, followed by native exosome, and followed by uh, uh, by uh, uh, PBS. Surprisingly, uh, a lot of mice in these uh, groups died because the severity of the disease was so high, but nothing in the uh, exosome treated one. So, exosome treated one not only helped them to survive, but also helped them to uh, you know, recover and walk uh, compared to the uh, uh, control model. So we were very happy, everything was good, then another question came up. People asked us, where do they go? That was another challenge. So, and back then, that was, there was not a lot of good data in the literature, so we can quickly jump on and do the experiment. Again, this slide took me, I think, six months of work. So all those uh, you know, good and bad memories. So uh, being animal facility, I had to feed the mouse before I feed myself. So uh, holidays, vacation, nothing. I had to come to the animal facility. People, you know, were enjoying their vacation uh, the, during the December, January. I was in animal facility hand feeding these uh, mouse because they cannot uh, feed uh, themselves. And the uh, guys at UC Irvine, they are so serious in the animal facility about that. You the fact that you take care of these animals like your baby. So they used to check my key card over the weekends and holidays to make sure I come in, feed them every day. Okay. To be honest, you could feed them once a day uh, or you know, once every two days, but they wanted me to come and f feed them two times per day. That was hell, but I don't know how I did it. Yeah, so. Um, but uh, luckily, I, it finished. So uh, then they asked the question, where do these vesicles go? So we stained them with some lipophilic dye. Basically, we insert some dyes that can uh, uh, you know, glow when you uh, expose them to some uh, light. We show that uh, these vesicles, this is IV. It push it to the blood. So uh, IV injection. Uh, for uh, both interferon gamma exosome and the uh, native, both showed us the same data. And uh, we show that uh, they go to the uh, uh, liver and spleen, but nothing in the uh, brain or kidney. And surprisingly, we do see it does go to the uh, spinal cord here. And Surprisingly, it only goes to the spinal cord for the EAE mouse, the diseased mouse, because technically they have this blood spinal cord barrier. For a healthy mouse, it's blocked, they cannot bypass. So we didn't see any signal in the wild type healthy mouse, but we did see the signal in the uh, 
uh, in the uh, um, disease. So basically shows that they get into the uh, physical, they get into the spinal cord, they go to the uh, liver and the spleen, and through some mechanism that we still we don't know, they suppress all those inflammatory uh, pathways. Uh, how much time do I have, Habib? Oh, okay, sure. So then that was good. We were happy. Then another challenge came. Uh, we used to go through a lot of conferences and present every time. We asked some hard question. Once come back to the uh, lab, I had to address that. So I went to a conference, a brilliant guy uh, from Novartis asked me, what is the mechanism of action? I said, well, I don't know, it might take years. It's not my business, I'm just a PhD student, I need to do it right and get my, this damn PhD. They, so I got back to the lab then uh, brought it up with my boss. He said, you know me lot, let's attack. I said, okay, let's do it. So we asked, they asked us, what is the mechanism? It's very difficult to uh, really determine the mechanism of action, these vesicles, but we did our best to address as much as we could. So oh, I saw a lot of doctors, so that's good. I don't need to go through a lot of these the basics, but we know for any medication, a drug, it consists of two parts. Active ingredient, which is the actual drug, and the excipient. Excipient is the non-drug portion of these, like a tablet, when you have some like salt or sugar. This is called excipient. And the active ingredient is the actual drug. But how can we have that for vesicles? The problem with vesicles is that active ingredient is lipid, protein, RNA, Excipient is lipid, protein, and RNA. So it's very difficult uh, to really uh, address that. Then we came up with, a, I think that was a brilliant idea. I don't know how I did it. Uh, uh, actually, I stole it. Actually, to be honest, I stole it from Jan Lotval, uh, my previous uh, boss. So um, I, actually, he gave me that idea, but I optimized it, like bring it up to a whole another level. So. Uh, so what we did, uh, we asked, okay, let's simplify it. We used KISS principle, keep it simple. So we decided to use this uh, KISS principle in this assay, say, let's ask a very simple question. Is it RNA or is it protein? Nothing crazy. I said, oh, okay, okay, so how can we do that? We, can, we, we knew that we can uh, degrade and, you know, uh, RNA uh, with UV. UV it's known to degrade for involved in uh, RNA degradation. So we decided to shine UV on these uh, exosomes, then do the functional assay. That this is what we did. But uh, Jan Lotwal told me shine UV for one hour. I did it. I basically uh, it was well done. So <laughs> it was like burned. I burned them. So. Uh, super well done. So it was so chewy, we couldn't even eat it. So then we decided let's make it like uh, easier. So in, from one hour we brought it down to 200 seconds of uh, UV uh, you know, exposure. So we optimized that protocol, uh, bring it from one hour, I t imagine how many time points did I check? One hour, you know, 55 minutes, 50 minutes, 40, 45, all the way down to 220 seconds. So um, um, definitely after the talk, I need a drink. It all remembered, uh, reminded me of bad, bad days. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we finally uh, secured the 220 second of exposure. Then we confirmed that the RNA is gone to the best of our ability. Then we also confirmed that we have minimal damage to the protein because UV also can, uh, you know, uh, uh, damage the protein. So we showed that we maximize the RNA damage, minimize the protein damage, then we said, okay, let's test. The Treg induction assay, which we optimized, was a good, uh, you know, uh, proto was a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, way to start. So we basically, previously we saw that they can induce regulatory T cells, increase the frequency. Then we were thinking if there is anything like wrong with them, they probably cannot do the job as well. This is exactly what happened. This is the control, 2.3%. This is the native exosome. It brings it up 
to 16%, very similar to what we saw before. And then we shine UV, it still induce TREC compared to 2.3%. This is the UV treated native. This is the actual native. So from 16% brings it down to 4.9. So what does it mean? One of the ways to uh, justify this is that RNA is, invo RNA is involved in their potency because we degraded the RNA. And even if you degrade RNA to the best of your ability, you still see function. So that indirectly suggests that maybe protein is also important. So for years, still people in the field say RNA and protein are the active ingredient, but there's, no any, there's not any solid data to, 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 to have a proof. That was the first study ever published showing that RNA and protein both involved. Even that is still indirect. It's very difficult. So again, for the gamma interferon, uh, we got the same thing. So uh, from 2% to 22%, and brings it down to 6%. So we show that the function is impaired when we shined UV. That was very good and we were happy. So then we asked the question, what kind of RNA and protein? So now we know that both RNA and protein are involved. Then we asked the same uh, next question, what kind of protein and RNA are involved? We send our uh, samples for proteomics and deep RNA, the sequencing going through a lot of pain because I had to work with a mathematician. So that mathematician only knew formula, and I only knew biology. So every time we had like three hours of a Skype conversation, and he used to get like angry because I didn't understand those crazy algorithm and formula, I was angry because he didn't even understand what, is pro what protein and RNA is. So <laughs> it was very uh, challenging. So it took me a long like, discussion and uh, like two years of collaboration to get this experiment done. So finally, we find some spe uh, special, um, like, not a special, uh, it's more uh, RNA involved in the uh, regulatory T cell function and immunosuppression. So we, sh we found that, uh, in, especially in the interferon gamma condition, we did see in, uh, uh, indolamine, which is a, a enzyme that suppresses T cell function. So highly enriching the uh, exosome. So that would be one of the, uh, like a high, like a indirect evidence that maybe they walk through those uh, pathways. Also, another question that we received from a conference. So I showed this data. I said, "Oh, indolamine is there." I said, "How do you know it's a full transcript of the indolamine? Maybe it's a portion of the uh, uh, RNA." That was a good criticism. Then I got back to the lab. We designed primers for three parts of this gene to fully, actually we did two, sorry, yeah, for two parts of the gene, the front and the um, uh, three prime and the five prime, the, the front and the end. So we confirmed that the full length is there. So again, that was another first proof that for some RNAs in this visible full length RNA is there, not the fragment of the RNA. So that was uh, uh, also, you know, we were happy with that. And we, confer, we saw a lot of microRNA uh, in those vesicles. I'm not going to go through detail. We confirmed the presence of those microRNA in those vesicles. And uh, we did look at the uh, uh, protein. We did some like, uh, interesting uh, protein like galactin-1. Galactin-1, surprisingly, has been suggested to, for the treatment of uh, uh, many autoimmune diseases because it's a potent anti-inflammatory molecule and we find it in our EV preparation. Then another conference, and so every, every conference that I used to go, I had to come back with, uh, with a new uh, experiment. So I went to a conference, I asked the show this galactin, they said, how do you know it's there? I said, it's confirmed with the, uh, these damn you know, uh, techniques, it's very well known. I said, no, you have to do Western blotting. We want to see it, seeing is believing. I said, okay, if you want to see it, then let's, let's do it. So we were lucky to get that galactin. The, you know, we, we tested with three different donors of exosomes, so we confirmed that galactin is there. So we show the galactin is there, and as you can see, galactin is involved with a lot of anti-inflammatory processes. Then 
this is the first conclusion. So uh, I'm gonna go through this picture like for two hours because I paid a lot of money to the graphic designer to design this. <laughs> so you have to bear with me. And I drew it with hand and it took the graphic designer uh, for like I think two months to, to, to uh, make it perfect. So what we did, basically we injected this, this is the summary of all those pain. So I, I, I name it pain, uh, pain uh, uh, picture. So the, uh, the pain picture this depicts that, you know, we have these uh, stem cells, we isolated the exosomes, we put it into the animals, goes to the spinal cord that I show you data, it suppresses macrophage, we, all those red uh, cells, we do see decrease, induce those green ones, which is T-Rec, and myelination, those blue. So, uh, and this is how we think, you know, uh, they do their function. And remember I showed you, we only see it in the disease uh, EAE uh, uh, spinal cord. This is how they bypass. The blood spinal cord barrier is disrupted in these animals and this is how they bypass and these are some of the uh, molecules that we found. Finally, the paper was published in ACS Nano. It received a lot of attention, luckily, and a lot of news. So uh, we were so happy for that. Uh, then uh, once I joined City of Hope with all those uh, basic biology background, I said, that's good, Milat. Uh, but this is a different animal. This is a different game. Don't think you know you know a lot about exosome. I said, for sure, let's, let's, let's do it. So there I realized that I don't know anything because now we wanted to do a clinical trial. Then I was thinking, oh my God, all those stuff that we've been using could be useful, but it's, it's the whole different scenario. So this is coming from a paper we published with some of these leaders in the field. Uh, basically, we discussed that if you want to bring exosome into the human as a drug, what needs to be done to do that. So we publish a review. So basically, this is a summary for uh, that review. We basically need efficacy data, either cell culture or animal data. Then it's, we have to have uh, some sort of mechanism of action, sort of uh, idea of how it is doing it, which we had for multiple sclerosis. We think that, you know, with suppressed immune system, increased TREC and all those sort of things. Also, this is very important. We did quality control test. We, every batch you isolate is different. You have to make sure it's like a drug. You have to consider it as a drug. Every batch, it has to be fully characterized, quality control test, potency test. You have to do it to make sure every single time they, they do function 100%. And it's not like you do uh, like a 10 isolation, nine out of 10 have it, uh, that would be good. No, it has to have it 100%. And every single time, regardless of I do it, or the technician do it, or the chair of the department, it has to work every single time because they follow SOP. So that was really difficult, you know, to make it really consistent, working every single time from all these donors that they have variation, different hands was a headache. So in two years, I helped City of Hope to optimize a strategic integrated process. And I'm happy, you know, help them to achieve this in only two years. So we, what we did was that we developed a, uh, a strategic manufacturing platform for them to do a uh, bioreactor to uh, you know, high scale production of these cells, going through tangential flow filtration to isolate these vesicles. So that ultrasound navigation, remember I told you that was the old method. Now if you wanna bring it to clinical trial, those methods are good for academia and some uh, research. You have to do it like professionally to the industry standard. So uh, we did throw a tangential flow filtration and we you know, isolated those off the shelf clinical grade. Why I call it clinical grade? Because we did it in a CGMP facility. So if you do it in a CGMP facility and follow all those you know, uh, uh, protocols and guidelines, it's clinical grade. So we finished that and this is how we do the over, you know, analysis for manufacturing. We do surface markers by uh, Western blotting and uh, flow cytometry and all those microRNA immunomodulation and all the sterility and all those sort of things. So, I, because there's a lot of interest in the uh, bringing these vesicles into clinic, so there's less known about the regulatory 
uh, and where do they stand as a drug because it's a particle is in between some cell therapy and is between traditional drugs so it, there's a lot of confusion in the field where they really stand as a drug I just put some slide you know uh, I'm sure you guys all know about it just you know uh, to you know reassure that you know uh, convey the message so the where do they stand in terms of regulation as a drug they are considered as biological medicine. So what does biological medicine mean? Basically, it's a medicine that contains one or more active substances, which is true because they have RNA, protein, lipid, and all those sort of things. And they could be derived from a biological cell, which is we derive it from stem cells. And uh, uh, their complexity as well as their, uh, you know, produce may result in a degree of, you know, variability which is, uh, you know, inherent with the uh, biologics, and uh, they call it biologic drug, biological medicine, whatsoever. So, talking about biologics, if you have these medicinal, uh, uh, you know, ph pharmacology or ph pharmaceutical drugs, they can be chemical, they can be biologic and uh, herbal. So, EV stands here in between, like, uh, uh, cell therapy and advanced cell therapy, EV stands here. So, if it's uh, unmodified, uh, you know, uh, EV. Uh, this is the review we published with some uh, other people. Uh, if you want to know uh, more about it, so uh, if you it's a unmodified, it's considered to be uh, biologics. If it's modified, you genetically engineer it, go through another uh, you know category. It now it's going to be advanced therapy because you gene, gene ma manipulate it. So depending on uh, what kind of scenario you use. Also, this, these are not fixed uh, scenarios. So, uh, as you can see here, the regulation is not fixed. If you use EV as EV native, it's biologic. If you use EV as vaccine, it goes through vaccine category. So you have to comply with another regulation. So depending on what kind of application you suggest to the FDA regulation, they consider it on uh, some different uh, you know, category. So it's not fixed. This is very important. And luckily, in Europe, Australia, and United States, we do have uh, uh, regulation to consider them as uh, biologics. And uh, the other important point that I want to convey is that they are going to be uh, regulated by Center for Biologics and Evaluation of Research, CBER, by, uh, which is uh, one branch of FDA. And uh, we talk about uh, active ingredients. It's basically when you submit to FDA, they want to know uh, a little bit on the mechanism of action. You cannot just show all those data. You should have a, like a kind of uh, idea how it works. So on the best of your ability, and they know you cannot 100% address that. So it's better to have some uh, like mechanism of action in mind. And this is the release criteria, which is very important. If you want to bring it as a uh, you know drug, it has to be... Uh, 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 Product definition has to be clear, purity, impurities, excipient, all those sort of things that we discussed, hypothesis mechanism of action, microbiology, contamination, and as for the exosome, we have to make sure, you know, we do the quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis, which is count, size, uh, 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 potency assays, uh, microRNA, all those sort of things, as well as, you know, this uh, contamination with microbes. And uh, lastly, I want to discuss about a little bit on the pharmacology side of it. Two minutes, okay, sure. So if you want to consider it as a drug, you have to consider the safety, shelf life, identity, potency, purity, quality. All those has to be addressed if you want to bring it uh, you know, to patient. And uh, uh, the uh, interesting for this EV is that the way you culture the cell can determine what kind of molecule you get into the EV. So if you use a special uh, conditions of to culture your cells, the product gonna be different. That's why in the field they say the process is the product. What does it mean? It means that the way you culture the cells, the way you isolate, the way you do every single step along the way, that determines your uh, product which is very different from uh, you know, uh, what we know as a traditional drug. So uh, hopefully you know, uh, soon there are gonna be these vesicles, many companies working on it. Um, uh, hopefully it's gonna be off the shelf EV for patients where, where when they go to the hospital, see the doctor, uh, 
they can get off the shelf EV, or if it doesn't work, they can get this themselves. We call it customization. You can customize it for the patient. You can get it autologous uh, uh, stem cell culture, isolate, even modify it to make it more potent. Going through those uh, quality control, boom, inject it to the patient. So, and this is all the people who are involved uh, with all those uh, projects. So I know you guys are tired, so I want to give you a quotation which gives you energy for the rest of the week, not the day. So it's a Navy SEAL mantra. So all those people who know Navy SEAL, they know it's a good model to follow. So you uh, have only got three choices in life. Give up, give in, or give it up. Give it all you have. So with that, I would like to stop. We'd be happy to take any question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Milad is proof positive that us geeks do have a sense of humor. So we have a few minutes uh, for questions, uh, and I'm going to be walking around. Milad, if you could stay up sure. there. Uh, sir. Uh, how, with the mice injections, how are you injecting? Or the intramuscular, IV? I mean, how are you or going right into the spinal cord? Uh, IV, IV injection uh, for uh, uh, one billion particle per mice. One billion, one billion yes. You can go to uh, like a 500 million, and we tested like 250 million. It wasn't was as potent, so 500 million was a good dose because they are severely sick. If they are not that sick, you can go lower, but they were completely paralyzed, not a be able to eat, drink, nothing. So you needed to you know, boost it with a high dose. Uh, the first question is, the, what's the source of the uh, exosome? What kind of cell source? They were coming Okay. Sorry, the second part of the question is uh, uh, you mentioned the, the, the uh, exosome, uh, normal mice exosome didn't actually uh, cross the brain, uh, blood brain barrier, but I thought exosome is uh, so small it can pass the uh, blood brain barrier freely. Very good question. So, uh, this is going to be a long discussion. I just give you two, uh, like, sentence short answer. Many people, who are, again, they are religious about EV. They think they bypass blood bearing barrier, at least in our hands. And we, I, we publish another paper, the fact that to show that do they bypass blood brain barrier. In our case, it's a no. They don't bypass healthy blood brain barrier. But yes, if, if it's disease condition like stroke, multiple sclerosis, where those blood brain barrier interrupted, yes, of course, they can easily bypass, but not for healthy. There's uh, some people in Europe, I don't name, but they are big guys in the field. They claim that they bypass blood brain barrier, but we don't see it. So best of luck to them. Uh, second uh, question, they're coming from bone marrow drive mesenchymal stromal cells. Yes, sir. I mean, uh, congratulations, nice. Thank picture. you. Uh, MSC has been involved in cardiogenesis. Uh, most of the people working in the area, you know, are, are aware of this. For these uh, microvesicles, there is a lot of concern about spread tumor. We know from tumor cells that this is a way how the tumor can spread and disseminate and, you know, produce uh, lymphodepletion, also to produce uh, uh, chemotherapy resistance. What is the, the knowledge, the current knowledge for these microvesicles in cancer? Very good question. So I personally didn't test it on cancer to see is induced cancer. But there is a few publications recently came out then showing that it does not help to grow cancer. How valid they are, I haven't, I don't know, but this is what they claim. But this is my personal feeling. If a cancer, if a patient has autoimmunity and the cancer at the same time, you don't want to give it these anti-inflammatory physicals because it suppressed the immune system. So uh, for those scenarios where the you know, uh, uh, patient suffering from like a cancer and another autoimmune disease, I don't recommend, you know, but these using these physicals, but if the patient only suffer from one uh, like uh, autoimmune disease, yeah, for sure. But uh, how it really, because they contain some growth factors and stuff, how it helps cancer, it might, or it might not. Uh, to be honest, I've never tested. So, yes, Dr. Kaplan. So, so we, uh, we published a paper on the EAE model, and uh, 
One of the pieces that you missed in all of your 400 essays TSU 6? is no. that uh, we document that the MSCs, not exosomes, but MSCs, human MSCs that we add to the mouse, actually make a molecule that cause the mouse neural stem cell to divide and specifically make oligodendrocytes so that that's the mechanism for the rewrapping of the naked axons. So have you ever done an assay uh, to look at the effect of uh, the exosomes on neural stem cell oligodendrocyte differentiation? Very good question. Short answer, no. Because even though all those assays took us like a long time, uh, we didn't really got a chance to really tested an oligodendrocyte neurons to see how they're induced, uh, you, know, uh, you know, regeneration of neurons. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. It may well be another mechanism in conjunction with all those things, remyelination and stuff, anti-inflammatory VC. So uh, even makes it more exciting and, uh, you know, uh, as a therapy because it comes, uh, we call it, you know, uh, uh, multipotent, uh, we call it like uh, multimodal. Multimodal means that it does do their job through multiple mechanisms. So. It could well be the mechanism, but uh, we never got a chance to look into it. So thank you, Milad, and thank you, everyone. I think there's one more question, maybe I answer uh, that. We'll to have time for one more question, sure. In your mouse studies, did you do any dose-dependent um, quantifications? Like, is there a number of exosomes per? Yes, we did. Uh, uh, I didn't show the data. Uh, we those all sick animal. 250 million particle per mouse was the minimum amount that was needed to see efficacy. But that depends on what is the severity of the disease. We use very severe mouse. So if it's uh, like a more healthier, you can go to like 50 million, 100 million. Depends on how severe the animal is. Per, per mice, particle per mice. 250 million per mice. So, Milad, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. We thank will you. have uh, time for questions at the end. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, we will take a short break, and I do mean short, uh, while we retool up here. So please get some coffee, get some refreshments. We'll be back in 10 minutes precisely.